Hello, fellow Masters of Wine students. This is Sabrina again, coming here with a presentation on pH and acidity uh, specific to winemaking. So here's a couple previous exam questions that involve pH and acidity. Examine the relevance of pH in winemaking up to the completion of malolactic fermentation, or excuse me, conversion. And why is it important to consider pH during the winemaking process? And I took a look at the examiner's feedback for that first question, and there is a ton of great information in here. Um, and it's actually a little intimidating for me. So this is what they said. They said that pH remains the cornerstone to the understanding of most chemical and biological reactions in winemaking. It has an influence on reaction speed, stability, extraction, color, and microbiological activity in wine. Most candidates gave a solid textbook definition of pH, but then many scripts started to ramble and it became obvious that many were not wholly comfortable with the question. Good scripts mention pH ranges for different wine styles. Similarly, good candidates express their knowledge of how pH levels are related to buffering effects of metal and how the metal ions combine with hydrogen ions in musts and wine. Candidates needed to mention that bitartrate ion formation is facilitated at a pH over 3.6. The relationship between pH and total acidity and titratable acidity, excuse me, acidity should have been covered. This question was not a question about acidification or deacidification, as some candidates chose to interpret. Efficacy of sulfur dioxide needed to be mentioned and how pH affects its different forms in wine. Anthocyanin solubility and extraction should also have been mentioned with regards to different pH levels. Good scripts gave detailed examples on how different pH levels can affect microbiological activity of different bacteria, or excuse me, yeah. Microbiological activity of different bacteria, there you go, tongue twister, including the different species of lactic acid bacteria and the desired outcomes with or without malolactic uh, conversion. Whenever I see malolactic conversion, I want to say malolactic fermentation. Candidates should be advised to gather a better understanding of pH in wine as it's, an important, uh, as its importance crosses over into many paper one questions on viticulture and enology. That's a lot. Um, so I highlighted in red the sections where I thought, okay, those are action items. These are things that we need to study and look at. And I admit that I am a little intimidated by this. Um, good news is that they provided really detailed feedback that tells us what we need to know, even if it does feel a little overwhelming. So this may be a long presentation. So structures of essays and structures of this presentation, um, thinking of structures of essay, for this kind of style, I've heard that um, doing chronological is helpful. So when we go into part two, looking at the pH impact at different winemaking stages, we'll go chronologically. And for the structure of this presentation, it's two parts. One is the definition and science lesson portion, and then we'll talk about pH ranges in different wine styles, because that was mentioned in the examiner's feedback. Onward! Let's start with some definitions of pH, titratable acidity, and total acidity. So here's a standard textbook definition. pH is the negative log of the proton concentration. And to make that more relevant, I like to say pH is a reflection of the proton concentration in the wine. I've also included a little equation here, so that's what it looks like uh, chemically. The negative log of the concentration of protons. Titratable acidity definition. The concentration of titratable protons in a wine. This includes the free protein, protons and the protons that are still attached to the acid skeletons. So I would say it's a reflection of all acids in a wine determined via titration. Here's a diagram of what this looks like. Titratable acidity shows us all the acids in the wine. So the protons here that are still attached to that skeleton of that organic acid and the free ones that are floating around. The definition of titration, 
It's the addition of a base of known concentration and volume to neutralize acidity of an unknown concentration. So in wine, we add sodium hydroxide, which reacts with those free protons to produce water. And during that process, um, the, the protons that are not free, so the H that is still attached to those acid skeletons, it actually becomes ripped off of the skeleton and it becomes exposed and can be titrated. So the titration process forces the wine to expose all of the possible protons and then those protons are neutralized. So in wine, every time we neutralize two protons, we infer that we've neutralized a single tartaric acid molecule with two protons attached. So we see two protons and we imagine a full tartaric acid molecule. In the US, we report the units as tartaric acid equivalents. Um, this isn't consistent all around the world. For example, France reports their units as grams per liter of sulfuric acid, so the digits look quite a bit smaller. And this idea definitely has limitations, um, the idea of titration or titratable acidity overall, um, because not all of the acids in our wine are tartaric acid. Uh, some of them are malic, some of them may be other uh, acid species that come from fermentation or spoilage, and uh, it's, not, um, it's not consistent wine to wine. So for example, a wine that has a TA or a TA of five grams a liter um, in a cab might taste different from a TA of five grams per liter in a Chardonnay that hasn't gone through malolactic fermentation. The acidity is going to taste different. And moving on to total acidity, this isn't a really a real thing. Woo! So this is the proton equivalence of the amount of organic acid ions present in the wine. So what does that mean? Total acidity is just titratable acidity plus metal cations. So metal cations usually mean potassium or K+. And basically what happens during the ripening process on the vine is that that tartaric acid molecule in the grape berry swapped its H plus with a K plus. And honestly, um, this isn't a very helpful metric for winemakers. It's very rarely used. Um, I hear total acidity used quite a bit more um, in marketing uh, literature because it's easier to tell a consumer about total acidity than titratable acidity. It, the word total makes more sense than the word titratable. Getting a little bit more difficult here, pH buffering. So buffers are solutions that can resist changes in pH. And there's lots of different buffered solutions all around the globe. Almost everything involved in life is a buffered solution. And they're complex solutions full of lots of different ions. So wine is a buffered solution because it has a complex mix of organic acids, protons, and metal cations. So different things with different charges are floating around. So let's look at pH ranges in different wines and your girl's got a database full of stuff and it's coming in handy right now. So I made this little diagram for you and I'm actually going to start using it in my uh, lectures for my students. So this scale here goes from 2.9 to 4.2. So that's the range of pHs that we expect to see in wines. Um, on the bottom end, closer to 2.9, you can see that we have sparkling and Riesling, Riesling of various levels of sweetness. So that ranges from um, Clare Valley all the way up to Auslese uh, German styles. They all fall in that 2.9 to just under 3.3 range. Sparkling tends to have a pretty narrow window, going from around 2.9 to under 3.2. Um, also, various fortified styles, looking at things like both sherry, um, Madeira, and port, um, and Aussie fortifieds as well, they all tend to have a low pH between 3 and 3.3. Um, and this is kind of where the relationship between um, titratable acidity and pH breaks down a little bit. They're not perfectly aligned. Um, because you may see Madeiras and ports that have the same level of pH, but when you taste them on your palate, you can tell 
that uh, the port wine has less acidity. It's just less sour. And that's a reflection of differences in titratable acidity instead of pH. The Chardonnays I've looked at, um, so I actually have um, about 20 different Chardonnays in the database, ranging from um, Western Australia, Sonoma Coast, um, and uh, Burgundian, and Chablis. And they all actually had a pretty tight range of 3.3 to 3.5. Um, I didn't include examples um, from uh, Washington State, where I'm from. We tend to be a teeny bit higher. And of note, um, those um, what I, I would consider to be somewhat overblown Napa styles of shards, they still fell in that range, even though they had pretty high alcohol. Viognier has a pretty wide range. That 3.4 um, was actually a Washington State Viognier, ranging up to 3.8, which was a Condrieu. Sauvignon Blanc and Pinot Gris um, tend to be a little bit lower on the scale. Sauv Blancs um, have a pretty wide range of 3 to 3.3. Well, actually, it's not a very wide range. It just looks wide compared to that Chardonnay. And um, that's something that you would already know on your palate, tasting soft blancs, they tend to be high in acidity. So 3 to 3.3, and that includes wines um, from um, Upper Loire um, and uh, Western Australia. Pinot Gris and Pinot Blanc, um, take this with a bit of a grain of salt. Um, I don't have a lot of these in my database. The ones that I did have were um, Northern Italian and Alsatian, or excuse me, wines of Alsace. I learned at one of my seminars that the people of Alsace don't like you to say Alsatian because it makes them sound like dogs. <laughs> so, excuse me. Wine of Alsace. <laughs> so, uh, they had a pretty narrow range here of 3.3 to 3.5. But, as I said, take with a grain of salt. I have many more samples from these other wines than I do for Pinot Blanc and Gris. Moving on to the reds, um, at the lower end, actually, uh, I was a little surprised, but then not so surprised after I thought about it, to see that Tempranillo had um, several with low pHs, and um, those of you that actually are passionate and informed about Rioja wines will know that those things can be pretty tart, um, especially the, um, the older style ones. So um, I had a couple wines um, that were, um, from the mid-1990s uh, Riojas uh, uh, that I included here, and those were on the lower end of that uh, pH. Going further up, um, more modern styles of Tempranillo um, from actually uh, from Rioja as well. Pinot Noir um, has a relatively small window, um, and it's very moderate. You can see it goes from 3.4 to 3.8. Um, these include um, wines from the Sonoma Coast and Burgundy. Grenache and GSM I've included as one category because um, sometimes they can be a little tough to unpack and unwind from each other. So there were a few Grenaches at the low end of 3.4. This is rare though and uh, these examples were Australian from the Barossa Valley where for some reason um, the pHs just tend to be low even if the titratable acidity or the perception of acidity isn't that low. Going all the way up to 4 and actually I didn't include the examples from my local area but we can be up above 4. So these can be really ripe styles from the new world, um, including my uh, beloved Washington state or areas in, in California, like Central Coast. Merlot and Merlot-based blends, I actually wanna talk about that with the Cabernet and Cabernet Sauvignon-based blends. You can see that the Merlots just tend to have a little bit lower acidity. Um, and I actually was um, a little surprised because I thought that um, thinking of Bordeaux wines, that they would actually have less and they'd be a little higher on the pH scale. And I think that maybe that's just skewing for um, New World wine styles where the Cabernet Sauvignon based blends just tend to be a little riper. Um, but uh, I actually don't have an explanation for that, but that's just what um, my database tells me. And I have um, about 50 different Merlot and Merlot based blends and Cab and Cab based blends in there. So um, it's not like I took two examples and tried to make some data out of it. Onward and upward. Oh, did I mention Syrah? I didn't mention Syrah. So um, 
Syrah has a stupid wide window. You can see that it's going from under 3.5 to over 4.2. And those over 4.2 wines are definitely from my home area in Walla Walla. Um, we just kind of have a, um, a style of viticulture here that really does promote um, excess potassium in the fruit, which uh, spikes the pH like that. Those lower pH examples were all um, from the Northern Rhone, um, some St. Joseph's and some Cote Rotis. But you can see that the window is very wide and actually reflects the wide range of climates that Syrah has grown in globally now. Um, I was a little surprised to see it that wide because Cabernet has grown more widely, but the numbers seem to be tighter, whereas Syrah, it looks like, produces such a wide range of styles or at least acidity levels. Moving on, so how can a winemaker lower the pH? And I know that the examiner's report said that this wasn't what this is about, but I think that it's good to illustrate a few points about um, the nature of pH and titratable acidity. So uh, it's not specific to the questions that they've been asking in the last few years, but it's still good info. So a winemaker can lower the pH with an organic acid addition, usually tartaric or malic, but we get into potential sensory issues here because the acid tastes um, too sour or disjointed. And sometimes because the wine is a, or the juice is a buffered solution, um, you can add a large amount of organic acid and the pH doesn't change because it's buffered, but then you've just dumped in a bunch of acid and the wine tastes too sour. You can do a strong acid addition, which works darn well, but it's not legal in many areas, including the United States. There's an old school method called plastering, and uh, this was used in Jerez. Um, it's the addition of calcium sulfate, and it also helps clarify the wine, but it's really, tr it's a traumatic thing. Um, it forces a change in both pH and titratable acidity. Um, a more modern and effective technique that can be used on wines is ion exchange column. So it swaps potassium in the wine for protons that exist in the column. And at the same time, it actually cold stabilizes the wine because the thing that's causing the tartrate instability is the presence of that potassium. So that is a good method. Um, it uh, is really accessible for larger wineries, but maybe not for small boutique ones because this is an expensive piece of machinery. So moving into our section on pH and tartrate stability. So I'd like to apologize in advance because this is an advanced topic. Um, this is college level chem here. But they did specifically mention this in the examiner's report, so I feel like I need to go over it. So I made a couple fun diagrams here, or at least I think they're fun. Tartaric acid exists in an equilibrium in our wine. So um, kind of an example, think that you're a, a winemaker and you're adding some tartaric acid. Uh, you take the dry powder, you put it in the wine, and it splits into different forms. And this is very similar actually to what happens to sulfur dioxide in our wine. It splits into different forms. So there's the form on uh, the far left here, tartaric acid. It's the tartaric skeleton with two protons attached. There's another form called hydrogen bitartrate, so that's the tartaric acid skeleton with one hydrogen attached to it. And then there's just tartrate, where both of the hydrogens have uh, left the skeleton and they're floating around both as free protons. So I'm going to attempt to address that section of the examiner's report where they mentioned um, tartrate ion or tartrate formation um, above pH 3.6. So um, I am trying to figure out what they mean by that and I'll tell you my understanding of the concept instead and you can make of that what you will. So here's a little graph and on our x-axis or the horizontal axis we have pH. And on the y-axis or vertical axis, we have the molar fraction. So it's how much of the different tartaric or the percentage of the different tartaric acid forms. And in the middle here, you can see that pH 367, we have a peak concentration of hydrogen by tartrate or HT minus. And that's pretty important. Uh, because depending on if our pH is above or below 3.6, the wine behaves 
differently. So I made a little animation. This, uh, uh, imagine this is our wine below pH 367. So we have tartaric acid existing in different forms and then also we have some free protons, we got some free potassium, they're all living in harmony. What happens below 367 when we cold stabilize our wine or we have tartrate, uh, excuse me, um, uh, potassium bitartrate formation or wine diamond crystal formation. So what happens here is a potassium hooks up with that bitartrate and that becomes uh, insoluble in solution and it falls out. So we lose that molecule as it precipitates out of solution. The system decides that it's going to throw a proton into solution so we gain a free proton in an attempt to, um, to re-equilibrate the system. And because we now have a free proton floating around that we didn't have before, we have a reduction in pH. So if we cold stabilize our wine in the traditional method with the bitartrate removal, um, below 367, we get a pH reduction, which is usually a positive thing. And if we are above 367, let's see what happens. So our potassium goes and binds up with that bitartrate, and it's removed. And then what happens is one of those free protons, it wants to go and attach itself to that other bitartrate. So uh, we lose a free proton from solution, and as a result, our pH increases. So basically, below pH equals 367, the pH decreases during potassium bitartrate formation, or cold stabilization. I should say traditional cold stabilization, where we physically remove the crystals. And above three, uh, 367, the pH increases during potassium bitartrate formation. So, um, I'm trying to reconcile my knowledge with uh, those comments on the examiner's report. So they were mentioning a, a potassium bitartrate formation above 367 or that it, it, it sort of implied that you need to have a certain pH to, um, to get that formation. I, I'm still a little confused about it. Uh, what I will say is that at these, uh, we have a tipping point at 367, so the wine definitely behaves differently at these different pHs. However, these crystals um, are formed uh, mainly in, a res uh, in response to temperature change, especially really cold temperature. So um, there's going to be no inhibition of crystal formation because we're at a certain pH. It's temperature related instead of pH related. Moving on to pH and sulfur dioxide. So prepare for more chemical equilibriums just like before. So this is the sulfur dioxide equilibrium, and I didn't make a cool little diagram. I just showed the, uh, the chemical formulas. So um, at wine pH, the majority of our sulfur dioxide is in that middle form there, that bisulfite form. And as we go down in pH, we get more and more of that molecular SO2, which is in the, the pure SO2 form. At a really high pH, we have sulfite, and that's not really relevant, because you can see, um, for those of you that have a chemistry background, the pKa, aka the concentration where that bisulfite and the sulfite are equal is 7,2, so that's just right out of range. So ignore that. Key idea here, lower pH means more molecular SO2, which is the more effective form of SO2. And this actually reminds me a little bit of that diagram I showed you earlier. So we have a molar fraction on the y-axis again, the percentage in a given form, and then we have pH um, on the x-axis here. So that little red dashed box is where we live in our wines, slightly below 3 and slightly above 4. And what you can see here, that red line is the SO2 concentration. So that's the molecular form, that's the really active form. Uh, if you need a reminder about this, you can go see my SO2 presentation. That's, uh, I believe, the first presentation I uploaded. And then the blue line here is the bisulfite concentration. So as we travel from pH 3 to 4, our bisulfite value goes to close to 100, and our SO2, or molecular SO2 value, goes to close to 0. Another way of looking at this 
is the requirements for reaching uh, certain molecular sulfur dioxide values. So um, the red line here is 0.5 milligrams a liter, which is frequently a target for red wines. The green line is a 0.8 milligram per liter molecular level, and that's frequently a target for white wines. And then the blue line here is a one milligram a liter level, which is usually a target for sweet wines. So as we travel along that pH axis here, going from 2.9 to 4, you can, uh, you can take a look and see that the requirements, how much free SO2 you need to have to reach that target molecular, so basically how much you need to add or have present to get to that target molecular, gets up so high that it's undesirable for a winemaker. So for example here, um, if I'm making, uh, hmm, yeah, 3.7, three 3.7 seven. Three is a good example here. So if I'm uh, making a, a ripe style of Viognier and I have a target molecular sulfur level of 0.8 milligrams a liter, um, looking at where that point is, traveling across, so I'm at 3.7 and I'm moving my eye up to that point on the green line and then traveling towards the y-axis, I have to say it out loud so I don't get confused, I'm over 60 milligrams a liter of free sulfur. And that actually isn't good for wine quality. It's just really high. Um, like for example, we bottle our whites um, at about 35 or less. So um, that, once we're getting to those really high pH values, doing certain molecular targets just doesn't really work. So, as wine approaches that pH 4 level, the molecular sulfur dioxide concentration just goes to zero. So all of that sulfur dioxide is in the bisulfite form, um, and uh, we have less antimicrobial activity um, from the sulfur dioxide, but we still have a good antioxidant. So a winemaker could lean on other microbial stabilizing tools instead of sulfur dioxide at those high pHs. So for red wines, um, or even some styles of white wines, remove um, a food for spoilage microbes, which is malic acid, so go full MLF, utilizing modern sterile filtration. And additionally, on some of those really ripe red styles, you tend to have high enough alcohol where you have a lower risk of spoilage just because spoilage microbes don't like alcohol. Moving on to pH and color, um, the examiner's report did mention anthocyanin expression, and it also mentioned a little bit about anthocyanin extractability, and I'm gonna talk about that in a sec. So here's some chicken wire for you. Uh, here are the players. Um, so these are color compounds or forms of anthocyanin that are active in our wines. So the red form here is an anthocyanin. The blue form is also an anthocyanin, and excuse me, anthocyanin, and it's in a quinodial form, which basically means that it expresses more of a blue color. And then we also have a form of sulfur dioxide here, which is color, excuse me, anthocyanin, which is colorless. And actually the majority of anthocyanins are existing in that carbonyl, um, our, our carbonyl, excuse me, form, which is colorless. So even if a wine actually expresses a lot of color, the majority of the pigments are actually not expressing any color at all. So I've tried to make a scale like I did before with the wine styles. So going from 2.9 to 4.2. And at low pH, a higher proportion of those anthocyanins are in that flavium form, which is the bright red one. As we increase in pH, a higher proportion goes into that quinodial or blue form. Um, and also actually a higher proportion are in that colorless or carbonyl form as well. I think I actually spelled that incorrectly in this presentation. Uh, uh, go back to the previous slide if you want to rewind a little bit to see the correct spelling, sorry. So that flavium red form is still present, but we do have a high proportion now of that blue. So as pH decreases, the color becomes a more pure red. As the pH increases, the color density actually decreases um, and more anthocyanins are expressing a blue color, but it may not appear that way to our eyes. You know, you've um, probably had some high pH Syrahs that look dark as heck, and it doesn't matter that a higher proportion is in the colorless uh, form. 
uh, to our eyes, it still looks like a very dense and deep colored wine. So simple, low pH, more red color, high pH, more blue color. This examiner's report also mentioned anthocyanin solubility and extraction. Um, and I want to mention this, but I'm again just a little bit like that tartrate formation. I'm a bit confused here myself. So uh, from my knowledge, um, pH isn't related to anthocyanin solubility or extractability. The factors uh, relating to those are um, mainly temperature and also a small amount of ethanol. And actually sulfur dioxide um, can also uh, uh, increase the solubility of anthocyanins uh, and help facilitate their uh, extraction from the skins. But ultimately, um, to my knowledge, pH is not related to solubility and extraction. Other things certainly are, but not pH. Um, if someone uh, finds information about this uh, and can prove me wrong, I would really love to read it because I get a little anxious when I see something in the examiner's report and it confuses me. pH and bacteria. So here's a big picture diagram thanks to Lalamond. So um, on our axis here, it's the, it's the arrow of time. Um, moving from harvest through to storage. Um, so storage being bulk storage in, in barrels or tanks. So during harvest, um, we have modest levels of microbes. Um, the axis here is cells per mil, and we have a log scale here. So going from the hundreds to the 10,000 cell count level. So uh, you can see that everything is actually going up starting from harvest through alcoholic fermentation. So that includes Enococcus, Gluconobacter, Lactobacillus and Pediococcus species, um, and yeasts. So all of these things here um, are forms of different lactic acid bacteria with the exception of yeasts. As we go into alcoholic fermentation, our yeasts uh, really take off. Um, we're getting in uh, 10 to the 6 is a million cells per mil, so then 10 million, 100 million plus cells per mil. And you can see that during that process, everything else, so all those other uh, bacteria are dropping off, they're being outcompeted by the yeast. Um, and um, just, wow spacing out here, sorry about that. Um, you can have um, malolactic fermentation going along with your primary fermentation. That's a discussion for another time. So during um, intentional and inoculated malolactic fermentation, our species counts on Gluconobacter, Enococcus, um, and uh, Lactobacillus can all go up. Um, and uh, you can see that they kind of plateau there during the storage phase. So the bad news is that high pH favors all of these things like the Acetobacter, the Gluconobacter, the um, Lactobacillus and Pediococcus. It favors all of those with the exception of Enococcus. So when you have a higher pH, you run a risk of having these players pop up. Here's a breakdown of the considerations for below 3.5 and above 3.5 pH for malolactic fermentation. Maybe I need to start calling it malolactic conversion since I saw that so much in the examiner's report. So below 3.5, it's more difficult to induce malolactic fermentation, and it's likely that a cultured strain needs to be used to inoculate. But the good news there is that um, off aromas are significantly less likely um, because uh, those spoilage bacteria don't like to live at that low pH. Above pH 3.5, it's a lot easier to induce malolactic fermentation and it's possible to go native on your MLFs as well. However, it's uh, much easier to get spoilage by species like Pediococcus and Lactobacillus. Um, additionally, um, an uninoculated uh, malolactic fermentation above 3.5 could just be going with Pediococcus and Lactobacillus. So as a winemaker, it's important to be informed about what species are in your wine. There's also possible biogenic amine production by Pedi Pediococcus and Lactobacillus. 
So that's when those spoilage bacteria take um, residual amino acids and convert them. So an example here is histidine to histamine, and that can cause histamine reactions in uh, consumers. Usually that involves inflammation, flushing, and headaches. Um, and I can say that it's, it's totally real. I've uh, experienced it myself many times. Uh, an example here for the below 3.5, um, I had a lovely conversation recently with Andy Smith who makes uh, the, or is a partner and the winemaker for Dumal Wines in uh, Sonoma in California. And they produce really beautiful low pH Chardonnays from old vines. And their pHs are consistently about 3 to 3.3. And they, um, almost all of their wines undergo uninoculated primary fermentation um, because yeast are pretty happy at that pH but they have to inoculate for malolactic fermentation just because native strains won't go um, when things are that low. Moving on to a chronological look um, at pH considerations in the winemaking stages. So we're finally there. Here's an overview for the main production processes on whites and rosés. Harvest, crushing and pressing, potential juice clarification, primary fermentation, optional malolactic fermentation, optional aging, uh, then clarification and cold stabilization and bottling. And for reds, pretty much the same. Harvest, crush, but fermentation before pressing. Um, almost all red wines also undergo malolactic fermentation, so that's moved from optional to standard. Aging, clarification and cold stabilization, and then bottling. So first step, I consider harvest and crush to be pretty much the same process. So pH here uh, impacts our microbiology. Microbes are likely to grow at a higher pH regardless of what they are. So you may need to take protective action if you have high pH. So that could involve more sulfur dioxide in the vineyard or on the crush pad. Um, more must chilling or harvesting in the dead of night to get the maximum level of coldness. And uh, if there's a risk of spoilage, also quick inoculation with Saccharomyces strain so that the Saccharomyces will suppress whatever stuff you've got going on that's inclined to live at that high pH. At the press stage for whites and rosé, there's actually not much to consider here since this is a short step that can last um, at maximum maybe about five hours. Uh, so not much to consider here. A little bit on the chemistry, um, higher levels of pressure or more press cycles. So that's basically increasing the pressure at the press, then decreasing the pressure because um, the plate or the bladder deflates. You roll the press or agitate it in a way that breaks up the the grapes that are in there, um, and then you increase the pressure again. Uh, this process is going to release more potassium from the skins, uh, and this is going to increase our pH. Juice clarification for whites and rosés. Again, this there's not much here since this is a short step. Um, something to consider with microbiology. Um, if this is a high pH wine, chilling is important. Um, However, chilling is already standard during settling and clarification. Uh, we want to keep things cold because there is a potential for undesired microbiology to take cold or take hold, excuse me, if we have a pH that really supports their growth. During primary fermentation, again, this isn't a critical control point, but uh, we should consider our microbiology a bit. Saccharomyces cerevisiae are tolerant to a wide pH range, um, which is good, um, but if you're selecting your yeast um, for very low pH, like closer to 3, you may need to select a pH tolerant strain. Um, and for high pH, uh, you may need to consider fermentation speed or methods of slowing things down if you want a little bit more extraction time because higher pH wines, it's, um, it's an easier for the Saccharomyces to grow, so they want to be a little more vigorous than if they, it was at a very low pH. Something to also consider here is if um, 
a microbe got a foothold early on, it could be comp competing with Saccharomyces uh, during primary fermentation uh, at a high pH. During malolactic fermentation, this is actually a really important stage to consider pH. So lactic acid bacteria are less tolerant of low pH than our primary fermentation yeasts. So below 3.5, the microbes are easier to control and malolactic usually needs to be induced uh, by the addition of a cultured strain. And above 3.5, you have um, a competitive advantage for the Pediococcus and Lactobacillus spoilage species. And these bad boys can produce things that smell pretty bad. Uh, so just off aroma is usually related to dairy or milk. So we've got acetic acid, buttery, cheesy, milky, metallic, and earthy. Um, and even more problematically, we can get biogenic amine production, which is the decarboxylation of those little residual amino acids. Um, and those can lead to um, histamine reactions, including swelling and headaches. Something to consider here as well is that pH always goes up during malolactic fermentation, so um, high pHs are going to get higher. Here's an example of this from our winery, College Cellars at the Institute for Enology and Viticulture. And this is our 2018 Estate Petit Verdot from the Walla Walla Valley. And we're looking at pH, titratable acidity, and malic acid levels. So initially, um, just post-primary, pre-malolactic on October 25th, we had a pH of 3.72, a TA of 8, and malic at 2.77 grams per liter. And when we converted that malic uh, into lactic acid, we had a pH of 3.94, a TA of 5.9, and that L malic was completely depleted. So you can see that we went up about 0.2 pH points. So that's pretty significant and that titratable acidity seriously decreased as well. During the bulk aging process, there are some pretty serious concerns about microbiology. So Brettanomyces definitely prefers a higher pH, um, and during our, excuse me, on high pH wines, colder cellars and sanitary processes are so much more important. So running a cellar temperature between 50 and 55 Fahrenheit, which is about 10 to 13 Celsius, or utilizing the best barrel cleaning processes possible like barrel steaming and potential ozone use. Um, something that uh, I actually hadn't mentioned here, um, and it would probably be a subject for a completely other presentation, is um, uh, microbial spoilage and pH in um, bulk transport. Um, wines are at pretty high risk when they're moving around in bulk, traveling from different locations around the world. Um, so um, pH can be really important there because uh, spoilage risk goes up when these wines are in transit because uh, frequently they are uh, subjected to um, heating and cooling um, when you're going around the equator. So um, pH can be pretty important there too. So nearing the end here with cold stabilization, this is a big consideration if the winery is more boutique and they tr uh, cold stabilize in the traditional manner, which is actually getting the wine really cold and forcing the tartrate crystals to come out of solution. So this is where that dark magic about pH and tartrate formation comes into play. So below pH 367, the pH goes down during cold stabilization. And if you're above pH 367, the pH goes up during cold stabilization, which further exasperates your high pH problem. During clarification, there's not much concern unless a winemaker is attempting to do a slow natural static clarification in a tank. And in that case, you want to make sure you're getting cold enough so that microbes don't take hold. Um, and um, this is not really a common method though. Frequently clarification happens somewhat rapidly um, because the wine receives a successive rounds of clarification or filtration. So it's not like it's just sitting out there exposed. And right before bottling we have our final chemistry adjustment. So this is really important. Um, this is our basically our last stage to adjust our chemistry pH and free SO2 concentration determine the amount of molecular SO2 that's going to be present in our bottled product. 
So some considerations here, um, one of them being speed to market. Um, if you have a low pH and you hit the wine with a decent amount of SO2, you may have a large amount of molecular that smells like a, a struck match. Um, and the wine that's quick to market may have that. Um, or, uh, and it may not be desirable. However, uh, at the same time, we see many uh, German Rieslings on the market that have that same quality. So that's maybe more of an aspect of style. And at bottling, pH actually isn't very relevant. Um, we monitor a lot of different things on the bottling line. However, pH, it can be monitored easily, but it's not an indication that something's going wrong. Like for example, if your free SO2 drops or you start seeing dissolved oxygen in the wine, we know that we have a mechanical problem, but pH tends not to give us relevant information during the bottling process. So this isn't really a consideration stage. That's all I got for you right now. So thank you very much for watching. Um, I hope that I covered all the information that we needed from that examiner's report. Um, for further reading or questions, um, I can forward you to some really good documents um, and I'm happy to answer more questions. Thanks for listening and thanks for learning with me. I love making these presentations because it forces me to go over the information that's in my head and really focus on what's important. So thank you. Cheers.